Recorded at the studios of Chicago Public Media, WBEZ, this is Stages to Success. The drive to excel is universal, as is the pride in a job well done. Whether you're staring down a decision maker for a multi-million dollar contract, a television camera or microphone, a negotiating adversary, or an irate conductor, the pressure to perform can be exhilarating and exhausting. Join me and meet great storytellers from music and business. Stages to Success is brought to you by NICAR, the Northern Illinois Commercial Association of Realtors. Today's episode tells the story of the pioneer of commercial real estate tenant representation, Julian J. Studley, of his namesake company. Our guest is Mike Solomon of New York, New York, Julian's original founding partner of the Julian J. Studley firm. Mike and Julian met each other in the early 50s in Manhattan, but Julian's story began in Belgium as the Nazis stormed across Europe. I realize you and I are doing something that's kind of unthinkable. I'm, I'm, this is episode seven, and it's the first time I've spoken with a person in the industry about somebody else, Julian J. Studley, and not asking them to talk about themselves. So uh, you'll forgive me on that one, though. You'll work your way into the story for sure. No, no. Uh, I'm perfectly happy talking about Julian. You mentioned to me that, um, like our guest from from uh, the first real estate episode, uh, uh, or the second real estate episode, Goldie Wolf Miller, that, that Julian had a, a family history with the Holocaust. Could you lay that out a little bit? They left about, if I recall, three days after the Nazis attacked Belgium. And uh, how old was he at that time? Uh, uh, Julian was about 15. So was he a French speaker, a French and German? Oh, yes. Spe- yeah, French and German speaker? Julian, having this mind that absorbs everything, <laughs> uh, spoke Russian, and I, I, I never heard him speak Polish, but I assume he did, uh, and of course French. And they came uh, from there? Did, where did they come to? Did they come to New York City? Did they go to another country in between? Uh, well, uh, I can really kind of pick it up from the time the, the Germans went into Belgium. Okay. Um, I know that prior to that, the two parents uh, wanted to live in Paris and and they went to visit friends in Belgium and never left. They went to Belgium about 1925, uh, and in 1927, uh, they had Julian. And in 1930, they had Julian's brother, George. I'm pretty good at this, aren't I? Yeah, you're, you're nailing down I'm your... surprised t- that I remember this you're stuff. You're nailing down um, your timeline. His father was an engineer. Oh. He had, he had uh, graduated a, a university in Germany. They thought they were going to live in Paris, but when they visited friends in Belgium, they decided to stay there, and, and uh, the father got a job in 19... 19- Forty, I guess it was. Uh, the the Germans attacked Belgium. Julian's father said that they got to get out. Uh, they loaded up their Buick. I remember it was a Buick, and uh, and they uh, headed toward the border of France. Okay. Uh, Julian put on his Boy Scout uniform and pedaled in front of the car to make it look as if it was official. But it's they still had difficulty in crossing into France, and so they didn't have proper papers. 
and it was very difficult for them to get past the French. Um, but Julian busied himself with uh, with the Red Cross, and so when they made another attempt to get through, and they had the Red Cross signal signal uh, on their on their car, it, they allowed them through. So and they went. And we're talking about a teenager here that that took the. We're talking about a fifteen year old. I never heard him talk about the car breaking down, <laughs> well, or what? that they had a flat tire or well, anything like. That. Well, it was a Buick after all of the forty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you should have been an advertising agent. Oh, by the way, uh, they took one other person. They took a person that the boys called uncle, whoever he was, but he wasn't. He was a very distant relative, but a very dear friend of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Studley. And he was also in that car. They took a road, they, 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 they stopped at an area close to the Spanish border, and they couldn't get into Spain. Hmm. I, know, I remember that. They couldn't get into Spain, so they went on to Nice. The, this uh, man, which who was a very close friend, uh, he managed to get a visa to come to the United States but never exercised it. Hmm. He he wanted to stay with the family. And in Nice, oddly enough, when you think of the war going on in, 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 in 42 and 43, and they, they did come along and ask Jews to register. I believe that the, the, the dear friend registered, but Mr. and Mrs. Studley did not. Mm -hmm. There was a day when the four of them left for Morocco, the first leg of that trip, and finally went to Cuba. That, that, that uh, very close friend of theirs, who had a visa to go to the United States, uh, Somehow, since he spoke fluent German, he thought that he he would he could talk his way out of everything or whatever. But in 1944, they took him away, and 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 uh, obviously he died mm -hmm. in one of the Nazi camps. Uh, the Soviets went to Cuba. Uh, Julian and George picked up the language quite fast. Yeah. And and uh George went to school and Julian hung out with some uh, Belgians who were in the diamond trade before they also escaped and went to Cuba. Amazing. And so Julian learned how to cut and polish diamonds. At what age is he at this point? Is he still a teenager? Yeah, of course he was still 15, maybe 16 tops. Amazing. And and so and he he was making some money there and helping the the family, really almost supporting the family at times. And they finally got uh, visas to come to the United States um, in, I would say, 1944 or 45. And they came and they stayed for a little while in an apartment on West End Avenue that was uh, rented by friends of theirs that they uh, uh, knew in Belgium. Mm. And so they stay there for a, cu a couple of weeks or months, and then they found their own quarters. 
Uh, Max got a job with some company that wanted all of their products to be um, uh, in, interpreted into Russian. Hmm. And so it was so, so it was sort of like a, a kind of a technical job and he got some money that way. And did Julian, Julian went into the diamond area mm -hmm. in, in New York. He was 16 years old, and he started to uh, build up a, 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 a clientele. He had a little business. I think it was within a bigger business. But anyway, he was making some money, and he kind of hated it all the time. Really? Yeah, he didn't really like the business or, or, or like the people who were in the business. They were uh, primarily Hasidic Jews, and Julian was definitely not a religious person. So he was uh, quite a bit more secular, and he probably just felt like he didn't fit in. Yeah. Did he, uh, uh, did he ever get to go to regular high school, college? No. Amazing. Julian's education really stopped. No, no, his formal, you, I must add that. Yes. His formal education stopped when they got into that car and left Belgium. But in the meanwhile, he's picking up Spanish. He's working in a new trade. He probably has four or five languages in his back pocket. Mm -hmm. Julian picked up English in New York, and so did his brother. And, uh, uh, he really was speaking five languages, some perfect, some maybe could use some brushing up on. George, his brother, went on, went to high school, and then I think George went to uh, City College and graduated. But Julian, he once told me that there was a family meeting, and the father and mother, the mother wanted him to go back to school and the father kept mentioning the different people who never had too much schooling, but uh, were very successful. Yeah, Abraham Lincoln didn't do so badly. No, Harry Truman didn't either. How did he make this transition from from frustrated with the diamond industry to real estate? Did he have five jobs in between? One? What happened? He read a an article, I believe in Time Magazine, uh, that talked about Zeckendorf assembling the land for the United Nations and, and selling the land to Rockefeller. And then Rockefeller donating it to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, that really intrigued him. He went to work for a real estate firm named L.V. Hoffman and Company. Okay. They were a real estate firm that managed loft buildings. Yep. They didn't know anything about office space. They managed loft buildings and the give the different people in that firm. If they managed four or five loft buildings, they also did the renting in those buildings and perhaps in other buildings if they found some deal. I think that Julian found it very difficult to get a job in other real estate, the, the more important real estate firms, because, I mean, well, I think it's obvious, right? A guy who... Uh, didn't have any papers, really. Uh-huh. Didn't have an education. Uh, walking in off the street, not knowing anybody, and wanting a job. That's where he was when he was drafted into the United States Army. He was drafted, and uh, uh, he was going to be sent overseas uh, with his company and 
and there was a sergeant who found out that he spoke five languages and said, you know, you should you should apply to uh it probably was the propaganda unit of the United States Army. What a perfect that handled radio broadcasts and, and you know what I mean and the and the army newspapers and, yeah, what, and a, what a perfect training like, what a perfect training for commercial real estate. I should mention that Julian and George got involved when they were teenagers in the gun running business of helping the new state of Israel. Okay. This was not a religious thing for them at all. It was a national, a nation building thing. You know, obviously, they were Europeans. Right. And uh, I, I assume they thought they had a, a debt that anything they could do to, to get uh, Jews out of Europe and to help a new nation that they should be part of. And did that remain a, a lifetime passion for Julian? No, no? absolutely not. Um, but so they were involved in that, and they were caught. There was a mayor of the city of New York named O'Dwyer. He had a brother who was a borough president, a lawyer, and a very active guy in New York City. And that brother got him out of of their trouble. Mm, thank goodness for Tammany Hall, huh? <laughs> I want you to know my father was leader of Tammany Hall. Well, there we go. <laughs> during a, a certain area, but uh, uh, era, when they asked O'Dwyer why he helped, he said, "Uh." Anybody, uh, anybody who would make it difficult for the Brits, I'll help. <laughs> he was a true Irishman. <laughs> the enemy of the, my enemy is my friend. Yeah, my enemy's enemy is my friend. <laughs> because of O'Dwyer, I believe it was, uh, he, he, he needed a boost to get into this very special unit. I believe he used O'Dwyer to help him. Get in there. The people in that unit were so smart, they could play chess in their mind without having a board. <laughs> Here is a guy who never went uh, more than the first year of high school, associating with incredibly bright people and holding his own. Well, when he got discharged... Uh, he went back to L.V. Hoffman. Okay. He didn't know any place else to go to at that moment. He wanted to become a broker. But at L.V. Hoffman, Mr. Hoffman never allowed any of his salesmen to become brokers. <laughs> so now I enter the scene. That's what I, I, I was going to ask that because from uh, my notes with Iris Shulman, he said this was around 1954, and I was doing the math in my head. Yeah, it was, yeah. Now I enter the scene. So I got out of the Korean War, and my father was an insurance broker, and he insured a lot of the buildings that were managed or owned by L.V. Hoffman. Interesting. So he introduced, so, so my father introduced me to, to Hoffman, and I met Julian in 1953. So was there something about, uh, did you guys get on well together? Did you have friction? The only kids there. I mean, everybody else were guys in their 50s and 60s, and, and uh Julian and I had just gotten out of the Army. Julian, you know, said to me that he wanted to lease office space. He didn't want to be in the loft business. And 
and this company wasn't for him. And so, and so he asked me if I knew of anybody that he could go to to get his broker's license. Hmm. And I did. Uh, there was a, f- a, a firm that did only retail leasing, and the last name was my name, but we're absolutely no relation. Okay. Uh, Gilbert Solomon. Gilbert Solomon had a son. Uh, I forget his first name, but he graduated Syracuse with me, and that's how I knew him. And uh, so I... So, so, so Julia went over to Gilbert Solomon, stayed there for about 10 months, and got his broker's license. And, uh, and started to work out of his fourth floor walk-up apartment at 400 East 52nd Street. Quite early on. And he got that apartment because... Oddly enough, L.V. Hoffman just happened to manage that building. And, <laughs> and so so he that's how he got that apartment. And early on, did he make overtures to you? Hey, Mike, I think the two of us could really do this. Why don't you join me in this office thing? How did that come about? One day he bumped into me and he said, I've just taken an, off, an office at 400 Madison Avenue. Why don't you join me? I said, why not? (laughs) It was that simple. Yeah. You know, there are people who measure everything they do. Nothing is a serendipity experience. Mm -hmm. Everything is measured. And then there are other people who say, why not? Mm Mm-hmm. I didn't know. I didn't have any obligations to anybody. I was still living at home. I joined uh, Julian. And did now he had a guy named High Gross with him. That was really his first. Well, his first, his second employee. Of course, the first one was himself. May I just say that that is the worst name for a person who's a tenant representative to ever partner with. High gross is like anathema. But I'll just leave it there as the world's worst joke on the podcast. Um, <laughs> anyway, t- t- anyway, high, high was part was one of the guys he met at the uh, at the. Uh, I call it the propaganda company that he he joined. Oh, one of the geniuses. Mm-hmm. Now I got to know High Gross, and yes, High Gross was a genius. Mm-hmm. Now High didn't. I mean, well, High to be a real estate broker was the equivalent of Albert Einstein being somebody who washes uh, the lab yeah. <laughs> after the scientists leave. Well, we can't, we can't tell the rest of the world <laughs> our secrets. Yeah. So, so high, everything to high, everybody, he looked down upon everybody. I mean, he had this kind of smile on his face that he knew everything and nobody knew nothing. <laughs> so high, uh, and high was there for about a year or so, and he left to go to Oxford. I think it not came. I think it was Oxford. He graduated Oxford and became a professor. Well, good. I don't know, and he stayed there for the rest of his life. And um, I know he became tenured faster than any other professor ever became tenured, because <laughs> he was a genius. <laughs> so, so it's now it's you and it's young Mike and Julian, and 
what were you guys trying to accomplish? Were you trying to go out and, and meet the owners of these office buildings and say, hey, we can lease these things up for you? What was your first strategy for young Mike and Julian? I think I, th- I think that Julian was was most interested in publicity. Really? At that time, yeah. He had to become known in order to be successful. Okay. Uh, there were, you know, Cross and Brown, Cushman and Wakefield, a few others that were that were dominant. In the city, they had their signs on all the buildings and everything, and so he had to he had to find other ways of doing it. You see, when you when you talk about Julian and you talk about all oh, the big deals the company made and things like that, but you know, Julian was. A promotional genius. Hmm. And I don't think many people look at him that way. So if he had been in advertising, he would have been a Leo Burnett. Yeah. He could definitely have been. and Or he could have been, he could lead any company because Mm -hmm. of his innate charm. It, it, It... you know, he wasn't he wasn't going to find the biggest deal. In fact, all those deals you talk about, you know, or, or may talk about, you know, they were found by other brokers, not by Julian. Well, what was his so, what was his angle in to promote his name to get himself to the point where you two young guys could get hired. What what was the secret sauce? Well, I think the first thing he did, and this came, uh, there was a a, a a a a bunch of new office buildings that were planned and going up in New York, um, and they provided this rare thing called air conditioning. Oh, my goodness. How about that? Air yeah. condition. You didn't have to open the window. So, so Julian decided that we should have the Studley Report. Hmm. The Studley Report came out, and it on each page, it listed a building that was Either just completed or or ones that were being constructed, and giving all the facts of that building. It's very similar to Barbara Corcoran's story with uh, with the residential yes. market in New York. That's 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 great promotion, just like what you're talking about. And the Studley report really angered Cushman and Wakefield. Why? Uh, it gave the impression that these were all our buildings. Oh. Julian made a daring move in a building on 3rd Avenue. It was a, it was a site. There was two owners of a block front on 52nd to 53rd Street and 3rd Avenue. And Julian got an option for 90 days, if I recall, for $25,000 to, in effect, sell that site or to buy it, to, you know. <laughs> but, of course, we didn't have any money to buy the site. So what he was counting on was that he could sell his option within 90 days. Okay. Well, he couldn't. 
And so the owners of the site gave him a verbal commitment for another 90 days for another $25,000. Oh, my gosh. This is like double or nothing. Now, Julian and, and, the, and the company didn't have another $25,000. Julian got a, a lawyer named Marvin Traub of a law firm, Dreyer and Traub, which was very popular law firm among the Jewish landlords in New York. And Traub, Gave him $25,000. Nice to have friends. And in the next to last day, I remember that clearly, the next to last day, Tishman woke up and said, oh, well, we'll do it. <laughs> wow. And for our friends that aren't in the, in the industry, Tishman Spire is still a huge player today. Yes. Well, so... Tishman woke up. Julian made a deal with him where we got 5% of the building, of the building they would erect, and we got the renting agency of that building. So you're still in, you're still in the landlord's court here. I'm really interested when you shifted to the dark side. But that, that's fine. That's a great play. And now you're involved, and now you've made it a name. And there's a name on the building. You know, that's that was a block front building next door to Seagram Building. And it was I had the name on the on the facade. And and you're the leasing agent. Was the company at that point called Julian J. Studley? Yeah. Okay. It always was called Julian J. So, it, you know, it became Studley. Uh, I don't even know when. I, maybe not. Maybe when Mitch Steer took it over. I don't know. I forget. But they dropped uh, the Julian. So that put him on the map. It put him on the map in New York, which is. Yeah. It, it, in this very closed society, it was very important. Mm -hmm. You had a major, major builder of an impressive new building going up. So it was important. And you two boys are in your mid-20s? Okay. Uh, this happened in the early 60s. So we were, we were probably in our early 30s. Okay. Well, yeah, really old guys by that time. Welcome to Stages to Success, highlighting individuals who have helped shape our industry in the Chicago area. My name is Chris Schramko, president of the Northern Illinois Commercial Association of Realtors. On behalf of our association, we are proud to sponsor this podcast series. NICAR provides valuable tools, resources, education, and networking to commercial real estate practitioners throughout the state of Illinois. To learn more about NICAR and the many benefits we offer our members, please visit our website, NICAR.com. Thank you. Stages to Success can be found on TuneIn Radio, Google Play, iTunes, or our RSS feed. The link can be found at www.stagestosuccesspodcast.com. Try telling your Amazon Echo, Alexa, to play it by commanding, Alexa, play Stages to Success podcast. We're listening to an interview with Mike Solomon, original partner with Julian J. Studley, Inc. of New York. I'm still interested in when this paradigm shift happen happened. The young I folks understand. started working with tenants. It, it was... It really was the... The good fortune of hiring brokers. We were really saying that we are doing our the job that we are trained to do. 
mm-hmm. helping tenants find office space in in buildings. So this isn't one of these uh, stories like Isaac Newton having the apple land on his head or whatever the apocryphal version is. Julian just didn't dream this up one day. What you're saying is some of his hungry, hungry young brokers started to see this as an opportunity to represent company XYZ. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That's, that's, I mean, that's all we did. You know, sure, we, if, if we were lucky enough or to, to get a nice agency, that's, uh, that's fine. But, but I don't think... I don't think anybody ever thought that we were uh, we were going into the landlord business. Yeah, but you kind of were in the landlord business because you were leasing that built that huge new site. So at some point, you had to make a shift where you're not just leasing that building site. You have a. T- we were just. I, I. I. don't think we were making a shift. I think we were just op- opportunistic. Okay, so when you were being opportunistic, it's funny because that's exactly the same word that uh, Goldie Goldie Wolf Miller used. While you were being opportunistic, does one tenant account stick out in your mind where you said, "Wow, we're going to actually represent this company and take them well, let to, me tell you, to a few buildings." Uh, uh, let me tell you. Uh, uh, a strange story. I like strange. Um, I think it was 299 Park Avenue, one of the Park Avenue buildings um, that was going up, and the landlord sent... Some information, including a picture of the proposed building, to all the brokerage houses. Uh, I took that picture and uh, I put the Studley name where the landlord's name was. Get in trouble for that now. Really? Yeah, they would. They, at least here in Illinois, they they slap you upside the head for that one. You're showing that I, you're you're showing. That's what I, yeah. I did, and and then I got together with Rick Marrick, and we we printed our own little brochure with, of course, the Studley name and, and the picture and everything, and we sent it out to law firms and. A man named David Schwartz called. He was the chief real estate partner of Crevasse, Swain, and Moore. Okay. Said he was interested in our building. Hmm. How about that? How'd you play that one? Now, David... Uh, after we had a couple of meetings, he said, you know, I would like to meet Mr. Studley. I've been, I've, I've read, I've read about him. So, so we introduced David to Julian. (laughs) And we never saw David again. (laughs) Because he worked exclusively with Julian from that point on. Well, he no Julian. Julian had uh, always had a favorite. He had either uh, Irish Shulman or Donald Schnabel. And what is what does that mean in terms of this uh, David Schwartz? So I, I'm I'm not following. No, it just it just that he so so Julian. Julian always would would work with one of those two guys, but okay. but uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not angry. I'm just telling it. But I, I'm what I'm really trying to get across is that that was a major major deal. Do you remember the square? Last way and more, 
the square feet, does it stick in your mind how many square feet they were, more or less? Oh, I a half a million. But that's not bad. Uh, but but I mean, but but crevasse is the Tiffany of law firms. I remember Rick Marrick saying to him, "Well, let me tell you what a few other law firms are doing." Okay. And David put his hand up, and he said, "Rick." It is of little consequence to Cravath, Swain, and Moore what other law firms are doing. Oh, you have that hoity-toity thing of the East Coast down to a T. How about that? <laughs> now, <laughs> it is of little consequence. <laughs> Funny how the, those things ring in your ears for decades. Huh? <laughs> Did you feel in the New York market at that time, the the late fifties, the sixties, that it, that there was such domination by the landlord in a really expanding economy that you guys, as the tenant brokers, really took this uh, knight in shining armor appeal, where you know we are we are going to save you uh, from overpaying in in this market, and you sort of you sort of got that that moniker and that that publicity? It sounds like Julian was very good at that. Some of our brokers would tell us that that they they uh, they got the exclusive because the tenant was convinced that we were a more honest representative of his problems in another brokerage firm that has management and and all other kinds of of services that they were they they were they liked having a broker that only represented tenants sure the conflict free pitch i've made it many times myself and, you know cushman and wayfield could say we we had, we control so many buildings we know exactly what's going on in all the all the on all the floors of all the buildings so we, there are secret deals that we that we could put you into secret spaces that no one knows about right because we control all these buildings yeah well, well you know it's <laughs> just that could that could hurt you when you're trying to <laughs> to uh, to capture a tenant. Yeah, uh, and 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 I, I mean I've made that point before. If that if that same brokerage represents billions in in assets on buildings and represents you as the tenant, who do you think they're going to go with? I, you know, I, that's been my pitch. I was kind of successful. Kind of, yeah. When I. When I told a, a prospect, or I asked a prospect, do you know how we get paid? Right. And of course they didn't. I said, well, let me explain to you. And then when I told them that, you know, if the longer the lease, the more money we make. I said, if there are options to renew, we make money on that. And uh, uh, I kind of they kind of appreciated that when no other broker who was wooing them ever said that. Right. Yeah, I try to be really open too about about the commissions. I I don't make as much on renewals certainly as as your company did, but they come around and 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 actually, I find that many clients have absolutely no idea that the landlord would be paying the tenant broker just like the the seller of a house pays the broker that represents the buyer. Once you make that connection for them, it's a, oh, of course. But And, and you get that argument from, from the client that says, well, then my rent's going to go up. But then you show them the savings that you make in the negotiation for them and how that compares to the you know the commission and it usually makes the that makes the pitch for itself um let me ask you remember when you go ahead when you uh if if you made a giant deal in a building where uh the option to renew after 20 years we'll say 
was that a reduced rental? Oh yeah, most of my most of my renewals. Now I, I haven't been at it long enough to have a twenty year lease come up, but uh, most of my renewals, the rental has been lower. Yes, the rental rate has come down. Well, is that because of the market? Sure, it's not not because I'm a genius. Oh, it's the market. No, has come it, down. It, well, it, no, it was. It really was because the mortgage was reduced. Oh, sure. Their costs went down, too. You bet. The other you know, side. and and, uh, and the broker says I was responsible for, <laughs> for the mortgage in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'll try that. Was the David Schwartz deal, was, was that law firm deal the one that really put Julian J. Studley and, and company on the map, or was there one other one that really sticks out, like, we we are the player now. Well, David Solomon Schwartz. Brothers, that came out of uh, Crevasse, Swain & Moore. Solomon Brothers was a million square feet tenant, one million square feet. That works. Wow. And, and this is the one that became later Solomon Smith Barney, the same crowd? Well, yeah, when, when Solomon began to crumble. Yeah. But it was a mil- um, a million square foot deal, and you were all over it. What happened was is that uh, David Schwartz, uh, in effect, introduced Julian to Solomon Brothers. Solomon Brothers was one of Cre- Cravath's clients, so huh, so. Uh, Solomon Brothers had just lost a deal they thought they were going to make somewhere in Midtown. I don't know. They were doing that without a broker. It was a Solomon talking directly to the, the, the developer. And uh, David said, why don't you speak to Julian Studley? So a deal was finally made at uh, Seven World Trade Center. Larry Silverstein mm-hmm. owned that. Now Larry Silverstein is involved with the entire World Trade Center. Right, of course. So, anyway, it was a very, very difficult deal. Um, it was a huge lease. Uh, it, that lease must have been a thousand pages. My guess is that Larry Silverstein thought he he canvassed the market and he said there is nowhere else that this company can go. If they want to make a deal within the next 12 months, there is no no other building. Hmm. So I'll just hang tough. And of course, Solomon Brothers says, don't you know who we are? I'll go back to your question, your point. You said, when did Julian J. Studley really start to hit his stride? That's where I interrupted you. When we really started to become a power in New York may have been Mitch Steer. Mitch Steer brought in himself, a great analyst, and two very, very good brokers. So this individual joined your team, and all of a sudden, business just exploded. Yeah, Mitch, dear, there are people who have a little magic. Yep. And there are people who are just, you know, very good brokers. But there's Mitch had magic. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story which doesn't really concern uh, the leasing of office space. Mitch and his group. We're going to Rockefeller Center to uh, uh, make a presentation to a law firm. In the middle of of his walk toward the center, he said, oh, my God, I, I didn't put on my lucky shoes. Oh, my gosh. So he, he sent one of the guys he was walking with back to get his lucky shoes. And he arrives at 
at the reception desk and uh, in, a, in a few moments they they usher him in to the conference conference room where there are we'll say ten partners sitting around waiting for the presentation and so he begins the presentation and there's a knock on the door and this lady says Mr. Steer he said yes he said uh, I, I have your lucky shoes <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want you to know that was the biggest icebreaker in the world. Really, it, it, he he played it for for good, huh? Yeah, it was. A, it really was. That that is amazing. So, so I I I recently uh, read this biography of FDR. Somebody, you know, from my parents' pers- perspective as New Yorkers, was just larger than life. And uh, one thing that stuck out with for me were was how the biographer uh, Gene Smith talked about some negatives to his personality that just made him all the more human. That that he would exaggerate stories that 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 make make these stories of uh, uh, his family being trapped by a Nazi boat when they were out on a cruise. The you know these things like this was was there a quirk? To Julian Studley's personality that that you know, you found interesting or uh, a negative side or something like uh, something like this uh, genius that you mentioned, high, gross. Was there something to him that you thought, wow, that's just an oddity, but gives the guy a, a human flavor besides just real estate superstar? Well, you see, I don't I don't associate Julian genius with real estate. Okay. I associate his genius with with a personality. A, a, a personality meaning what a psychologist would call personality. So what were his magic shoes? What what what's a story that you could tell that's just it's like prototypical to the man? Uh, I mean there is no there is no other person in the world who, when we were a tiny company, and I mean, maybe we had 15 people, and he would take off. Take off like where? He would go. He would go. Where are are you going, Julian? Well, I'm going to go to Japan, and then from Japan, I think I will go to Pago Pago, and then I'll go to whatever. For how long? (laughs) And, And... now and then he would call in to find out if any deals were made or whatever, and he'd come back two months later. Two months. And he wouldn't do that just once. He did that going to South America. He did that going to uh, 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 Europe. He, or it just... He... <laughs> I mean, what are the guy who's just starting, really, a company would do that. What was it? He didn't have any money. I mean, that he could, you know, he wasn't the playboy of the Western world. Was it Vanderlust with him, do you think? He just needed to go out and see the world? It was part... You know, when he started the Studley trips, back in 19... He started the trips in 1970. It was the commitment trips. Anybody who made over a certain amount of money that year, or the previous year, the previous year, would, uh, plus a few other people, of course, would go on a trip. We would... We would have some talks about the business, but we would also have fun. And how long were how long were these vacations or trips? Uh, a week, you wow. know, ten days. Great. Tops. What were your where, um, What were your favorites? Where did you go? Well, the first trip was to Cartagena, Colombia. 
Amazing. You see? Now, I probably, all of these places that we went to were places that Julian himself had visited previously. There you you go. know what I mean? Those times when he was taking off. Right. He was exploring things that he, he, he probably said to himself, you know, I'm going to take my guys here if I ever get enough money together. That's great. And so, I mean, we've been to you know, Cartagena and Portugal and Chichi Castanengo in Guatemala. Oh, I love that name. I can't spell it, but Chichi Ch- Ch- Castanengo. That's amazing. We went to London. We went to Chewton Glen. Uh, we've been to, obviously, Barcelona and Ireland and Rome and Sicily. We went to Morocco. Let's see now. I concentrate on America, uh, Milan. And, and Venice, Italy, we went to, uh, we, oh, we went to uh, Mexico and uh, City. And Mike, we went to a- I'm learning a lot about you. you, you you're, wondering yeah, about, yeah. you're wondering about some details about other things, but when it comes to these trips, you've got them like a catalog. I can got- tell what you had fun doing. Yeah, we went to Buenos Aires. We were in, uh, uh, it, it, you know, there was no... Uh, Paris. We went with a we went with a windjammer to the Virgin Islands. We had our own boat. Oh my! Did wives get to go along on these? No, no. <laughs> we, we went to uh, Egypt. There were a few wives that uh, hung around, waiting for the trips to end. Yeah, they went to. We were in. Uh, Buenos Aires, uh, it, it was all over. You know, I, I'm trying to... Th- oh, we went to Quito, Ecuador. Wow. We went to the Guala- uh, 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 Galapagos yeah. Island. Yeah, Darwin. So <laughs> we went... Uh, I, it, 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 and you know what? Um, the, the, the Mitch Steer and the, the new ownership, they continued the trip. Oh, that's really cool. Which means that the, uh, the, 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 the public company in London, they agreed that these trips should continue. What was the group, what, what was the cutoff, sort of the number of people? What's the largest group? Well, it started with uh, probably 12. We went uh, the, the first trip to uh, Cartagena. Um, probably had... Twelve people. That's a lot of people for a young company to be sent. And now, of course, there are seventy that usually go. Wow. Seventy, so, eighty, depending. So I want to 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 close up our interview, Mike, and I just can't thank you enough for really illuminating a, a huge part didn't, of our I, history. You want you know I didn't talk about Julian enough. Well, but yeah, yeah well, I you I, definitely get the flavor of the man. If there's something you want to add that just really sticks out to you, something that even further shows Did you hear who the about guy our was. Ping-pong table? Your ping pong table. No. We had for a long time until we had to take that room and turn it into a, conf- a, a, a conference room. We had a ping pong table in all our well, in all our offices. Well th- then you know that Julian J. Studley was really a hipster before his time. How long were you and Julian Working together, I mean, when 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 was the which of you was the first to retire and say this has been a great career, but it's 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 time well, to we, go. We we both it was about the same year. I mean, the company was sold right in 2014, right? But when did you guys leave the office and close the door for the last time? Well, I did it about 15 years ago, and so did Julia. That's in, in your mid seventies. That's yeah. That's terrific. yeah. I, I I lasted till about nine. Uh, I was about seventy four, seventy five. Wow. Something like that. Wow. 
So then all... they threw me out. They <laughs> threw you out. <laughs> they threw me out. You know, I just, I, uh, I didn't have any stock anymore. Everything was sold, and uh, yeah, and that was it. Wow, wow. I wasn't. I wasn't making any deals. And you're uh, died in the wall, New Yorker. You've. Uh, you, it sounds like you live on the Upper East Side now. You've lived there yeah. your whole life. Right. And are well, you are you a Mets or a Yankees fan? Yankee fan. Okay. Always been. Okay. Okay. Mike, I I can't thank you enough uh, for being uh, on this podcast and you know, you know if you it. say, "Gee, I wonder what happened here," or you want to know some more deals, I can I can probably give you more deals. But I just if you're getting the flavor of Julian Studley, I always say Julian taught me how to see. Interesting. And that is how. What? How did he teach you how to see? Uh, well, if we were walking together in some market in some dusty little town, he would press my arm and said, Mike, Mike, look, look over there. And there would be some native sculpture or something like that, that, uh, in effect, really was a piece of modern art. And only, only Julian could point that out. Wow. Uh, uh, he sounds like... He didn't have to be in real estate. He was a very gentle man that could get a little angry could have a little temper at times, but was you know, just understanding. And that's why people, people, uh, I guess, crowded around him mm -hmm. that, you know, wanted to be in this company. There was never any bad things ever said about Julian Studley. Yeah, and it sounds like be, it sounds like be in his company in the professional sense, and be in his company with a small c in the personal sense. There was just great loyalty. Very few people ever left. Wow! Because because the people were smart. The people were were uh, were loyal. Yeah. And and we had fun. <laughs> I really, can, it, I can it, tell. It, hearing you talk about those trips, I can tell. Yeah, it, there was there was always a little bit of fun. You know, when we were in Manaus, which is in Brazil, uh, and we had four or five very good producers. That was their first year of going on the trip. And they were tied to trees. Now, of course, they were tied loosely, but okay. their clothes were hanging off of them. They were tied there in the mist and the swamp in Manaus. It was sort of like an initiation. Uh-huh. And a guy from National Geographic who was in Manaus for a completely different reason happened to follow these 70 white men walking around in the woods. <laughs> he followed us and he took a picture. Oh, that's amazing. And you, there they are in National Geographic and the whole story about Studley Trips. That's fabulous. I mean, you could you could probably get it out of Google or someplace. That that trip and the picture. One of the guys on that uh, in the picture is is uh, uh, Michael Colacino, who's the president of Studley now. 
think if you want to talk about Julian, it's it, it, it's somebody who never graduated high school yet probably read more than you and I put together. Mm. Yeah. As and uh been appointed to I mean the new school. Julian was was practically the boss of the new school. Wow. Julian was the one who found the the next the, that that president uh uh, K- Kerry, the former senator and governor of uh, ne- Nebraska. Okay. He, I mean, Ju- Julian said to uh, to Kerry, uh, "Could could you think of somebody for the presidency of the new school?" And Kerry said, "Who's what's the new school?" He said, "Well, why don't you look it up?" Wow. So Kerry came back to him and said. Julian, were you thinking about me when you asked me to find somebody? <laughs> Julian said, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I figure it out. <laughs> That's great. Um, the, but you say to me, well, how did Julian know a former governor and senator of Nebraska? <laughs> I mean, there are histories and stories that go, I mean, uh, I can only, I can only tell you that uh, I am lucky mm-hmm. that many, many years ago, I walked in to an L. V. Hoffman office. Yes, and met that man. And as you said, <laughs> serendipity. And yep. just go. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike. What a what a privilege and what an honor to speak with you. I hope you enjoyed and were touched by today's interview with Mike Solomon, original partner of Julian J. Studley of New York. I'm your host, John Hunter, digital editing and technical assistance from Monty Scott, and recorded at the studios of Chicago Public Media at Navy Pier. Join us again for People and Stories from the Worlds of the Symphony Orchestra and Commercial Real Estate for our next episode of Stages to Success. To Success. To Success. To Success. To Success. success.